Okay, so thanks for coming. Um, this, I, I give an explanation of uh, the very long title. Um, this is actually a prequel to the Pearl paper that I gave last, uh, last year. Uh, and what happened in that paper was I was proposing um, service system thinking as a way of uh, a, a, a modification of some of the things that are in pattern language. And when I gave that talk, I came to realize that there's all this other context behind that and that people don't understand the context. So what are those contexts? The contexts are wicked problems, systems approach, pattern language talk about, ecological epistemology, hierarchy theory, interactive uh, value. And so I have a workshop tomorrow to cover most of that content, which is in the middle of this one. Um, this talk is going to be the theoretical talk about multi-paradigm inquiry that generates a service system thinking. So I'm not going to give the talk that I gave last year. I'm going to give you the motivation and the theoretical work behind it. In the workshop tomorrow, I'm going to skip the theory and go into um, a workshop mode where we go through each one of those paradigms and I'll give you the opportunity for people who will come uh, to have a discussion there about what paradigms you're actually using. Because Christopher Alexander has his own paradigm, um, which gets a little cloudy and people get confused at that, um, but then that may or may not be what you want to do. Um, the slides are available. Um, for those of you who are looking for the slides and you don't yet have a bookmark, come and get a bookmark. Uh, it's on coevolving.com, and so um, the paper is also available there. So, just going to cover three things. One, what is multi-paradigm inquiry? Because I'm actually doing a PhD, and the research method I'm using is multi-paradigm inquiry. Then, secondly, I'm going to go over very quickly uh, where have or where might between 1960 and 2010, have paradigms influenced general pattern language. And I'm very careful with the way I use my language. So I hear a lot of people saying patterns, but I think you should actually be using pattern language, not just patterns. And as a matter of fact, I'll show you some things that say, maybe if you want to be close to Christopher Alexander, you should be focused on generative pattern languages, not just pattern languages, and there's a difference. The last part is why might a pattern language project or community pay more attention to its paradigm? And so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, take some time on the front end, I'm going to squeeze in the middle end, and in the last five minutes I've got, I'll cover the last part. And I'll be around, I could talk to uh, in more depth all these things. So a paradigm, what is a paradigm according to the Oxford English Dictionary? We'll go to the fourth definition, conceptual or methodological model using the, underlying, the theories and practices of a science or a discipline at a particular time. It's a generally accepted worldview. Now, if you have to get down to the technicality, a worldview is generally an individual, and a paradigm is across a community. And the most, most famous um, one that every PhD student is supposed to read is Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions. He talks about normal science, which means research firmly based on one or more past scientific achievements, as you're moving along, so if you're Newtonian physics and you believe in Newton, then you get, all of a sudden, Einstein comes along, and then you have a shift. Um, so when you have that shift, you have, uh, you, so we have a paradigm, then you have a shift in, within the paradigm. Now the issue is that you have this period of normal science, and you've got a period of revolutionary period. And this is, um, this is, in um, physical sciences generally. Um, people talk about physics envy sometimes. And so in social science, they don't necessarily subscribe to this. In social science, you subscribe to multiple paradigms um, existing at the same time. But if you go back, back to um, more traditional science, you have this period where you have the databases, instruments, the conceptual frameworks, the gold standard, institutional organization, and the research culture. And then you have a paradigm shift when you have different databases, different instruments, conceptual frameworks, everything is different and it hangs together differently, and you have this period of revolutionary transition. And normally when you do this, you have incommensurability, which means that you're trying to do stuff, an example, in a Newtonian sense, and Einstein goes along, all of a sudden the equations don't make sense anymore. You can't do it that way. So the way that most people have worked traditionally has been in a single paradigm. But if you look at, uh, this is actually in the management literature, so this is from uh, Human Relations. 
Um, there's different approaches. Uh, multi, multi paradigm inquiry is one of them. So the traditional modern paradigm has a centering ideology. It's centered around the one idea. It's got a strong ontology, and you've got a restricted epistemology. So what you know is very, very limited and constructed. Then we have the idea of postmodern, where you decenter. You have a weak ontology, and you have eclectic epistemology. So this kind of goes all over the place. The proposal, and this was done in uh, 2002, this paper, is that we should be looking at a multi-paradigm approach that's more accommodating, and so you value divergent paradigm lenses. So if you're going to look at it from multiple points of view, then you explore the paradoxes and the plurality. So if you take the example of, again, Newton and Einstein, it's kind of like, okay, well, we don't, the actual definition when you read Kuhn is when you have a scientific revolution, you're supposed to take all the textbooks and burn them because it's no longer valid. But people still use Newtonian physics a lot because it's practical, right? So this would be actually a multi-paradigm approach. So there's a paradox there. We can deal with the paradox in, plur in plurality. Most people do Newtonian physics. You're building a house. You're not going to be meeting Einstein, right? Um, stratified ontology. There's multiple dimensions. You expose the interplay of the, of the entries and the, pros uh, and the processes and a pluralistic um, epistemology, so you have divergent paradigm lenses, and a lot of it depends on, um, the or it, it, you have different paradigms even within a single organization, so you've got tensions and you encourage greater reflexivity, and so what, that's what I'd like to do with this community, is what is your paradigm? So if you think you don't have one, then you already have one, you just don't, you're articulating what it is. So let's talk about some paradigms, and I'm going to wind way back and, uh, and give you some stories. And I had a blog post um, that I just told you, I'll tell you uh, that I had up, and I'll just tell you what this is. So the first thing is that um, when I look at Christopher Alexander, we can start all the way over 50 years, and, you, and when the, the key here is actually the top ones are books, and the bottom ones are articles. Okay, so these are the ones you read. And the thing I'd like to... Um, make sure that people appreciate is that if Christopher, you consider Christopher Alexander a scientist, what he was doing was writing about what he knew at a certain point in time. So in 1964, he writes uh, no science before, and he's using terms like process of design and goodness of fit. Okay? In 1965, city is not a tree, natural cities, artificial cities, and that's when the semi-labs comes out. Um, 1968, a pattern, actually, 19, 1967, the pattern manual is actually the charter for the Center for Environmental Structure. There's only, I discovered accidentally, that I thought they were in, in, in uh, WorldCat, said there were two copies in the world, one's at Berkeley and the other one's at Harvard. I went to Berkeley, I photographed it, noticed the first two pages are missing, uh, sent a note to the librarian and say, call Harvard, get the other two pages. 20 minutes, I get a response. They say, Harvard's missing their copy. We're moving art into the rare book collection. So there's one copy in the world of the pattern manual, as far as we know. Um, and, and it actually uh, has a really good description uh, or idea about what he thought patterns were, talking about um, three, uh, house signs, house numbers, as you're driving. So if you are by a busy highway, which is a context, you need big numbers so people can read it. If you have a slow street, then you have little numbers. You don't need to big signs. So that's where the context starts coming out. Based off that, 1967, 1968, a pattern language which generates multi-service centers. I really, really like this book. Um, this one describes the uh, design. Um, they weren't really implemented. The design of multi-service centers because you have uh, poor people who are going in and they need um, physical, uh, they need housing, they need um, physical checkups, they need mental health, they need child care, they need all these kind of things, and it used to be spread across multiple departments. Now in that, when this, despite the fact of multi-service centers, what Alexander writes in that book is, we're only focused on the building. We are not focused on the services. Okay, so he says we're just focused on the building. Uh, you have 1967, <coughs> system generating systems. And the idea he has there is system as a whole and generative system. Uh, then we go up to 1975, Oregon experiment, organic order, participation, peaceful growth, pattern language, uh, timeless way of building. Uh, arrows kind of go out here. 
In 1998, he had a talk at Uppsala, which is a computer science conference. He published that, um, and there's actually differences between the talk, which is on YouTube, and the paper that got published on the origin of the pattern theory. Um, let's see, where are we? 1999. Uh, so 2002, 2005, he released The Nature of Order. There's a really interesting paper, if you haven't seen this one, in 2003, it's on, the, uh, on his website. New Concepts in Complexity Theory, a Scientific Introduction of the Nature of Order. There he talks about wholeness and value, recursive structure, objective measures of coherence, um, sustainability and morphogenesis, which was done for the Schumacher Institute, um, and then generative codes in 2005. Um, empirical findings of the nature of order, where he talks about life, wholeness, wholeness extending transformations, and he says here that he revised the language from the nature of order. The nature of order was structure extending transformations. He says, no, I want to say wholeness extending transformations. So then in 2012, he publishes the work from 1985 in the battle, right? So people coming to Christopher Alexander who start here in 1977 and focus on one book are missing a lot, right? You're missing all the stuff before, you're missing all the stuff after. So um, now, while we're doing this, um, I want to focus on Berkeley, and I want to focus on three people at Berkeley, and, and, Church, and um, Alexander is one of them. So, I want to, uh, the first person is Wes Churchman, who is the father of the systems movement, the modern systems movement. So those of you who know systems theory, and you go back to Robert Lamphy, no, I'm talking to the next generation after that, right? So, uh, Churchman um, joined Berkeley, he was in the business school, he was a philosopher, and in the uh, space sciences lab for, uh, for NASA. Um, one of his students, Ian Mitroff, wrote a book called The Subjective Side of Science. And so Ian is still in Berkeley, I just know regularly. And he, he retired and then taught peace and conflict studies in the end. Uh, the second person, Horst Riddle. Uh, now he came in um, at the same time, so the dean was uh, Worcester, and he hired both Horst Riddle and Christopher Alexander at the same time. So you've got these three figures. And um, now I'm going to do a little bit of history of science. Uh, what really piqued me was that in one of the Facebook groups, Thor Mann was Horst Riddle's teaching assistant. Okay? And he said, both Alexander Riddle were part of the time what was called design methods movement and architecture. They worked and taught in the same building and did talk and were seen walking off to have lunch together. Church was teaching in the business school a few minutes down <coughs> campus. Okay. So you've got these three people at Berkeley with these ideas, what happened? And so the interesting part from this is that um, what I like doing is not focusing on these figures, I like going to the grad students. What are the grad students doing? The grad students are actually going back and forth between them. So, um, uh, so talking to people, um, so I had, um, uh, so I was talking to Max Jacobson, and Max said yesterday, he asked Horst Riddle to be on his doctoral committee, and Horst said no, because it'll cause you trouble, because Alexander's got his own thing. So, so you've got that going on. And then uh, I talked to, um, uh, to Hajo, nice, and, uh, and he said that he actually took West Churchman's classes, so he was in there, right? And then I just asked Howard Davis a couple of hours ago, and I said, did you get associated with all this? And he said, uh, he sat in one class from Horst Riddle, but then the cigar smoking drove him out and he never went back. <laughs> so, so you have all this happening at Berkeley, and you have students who are learning across them, but then the question is, you know, what, did, what is it that you're doing in focusing on one body of work? And so, again, I want to come at this multi-paradigm. We have at least three paradigms here. Can we do something to bridge? Is Christopher Alexander the only person we look at, and from a systems so I'm a system science person from a systems theory perspective. If you are doing Alexander only, I would accuse you of being reductive, right? So if the idea of systems theory is draw in other ideas, because Alexander was not by himself either. He was at Berkeley for all that period, and he was talking and arguing with these guys. So when they had lunch, what were they talking about? That fundamentally is what this is all about. Okay, so I'm going to bring up three articles of the example. Um, this one, systems generating systems. So why would I believe that Christopher Alexander was a system thinker or trying to be a system thinker? So in 1968, he published this article, and this is exactly what he wrote. There are two ideas in the word system. The idea of a system as a whole and the idea of a generating system. So 
So how many people have written about generative systems, right? It's like, okay, it's supposed to be in the pattern language, and he assumes it's there, but it turns out that this is not necessarily the case. So when um, being over at uh, PLOP, the pattern language of the program, with the Hillside group and the computer science people, uh, they actually, there's a, the, a book called Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software, right? Now, when I was talking to Ralph Johnson, who is one of the authors, it turns out that they did not write to Christopher Alexander's specification when they wrote that book. They accidentally did it at the same time that Richard Gabriel was doing his research. So they came together, but if you actually read the original Wikipedia pages um, that uh, Ward Cunningham still, uh, still hosts, they have what they call quote unquote gamma patterns. Gamma patterns are in the design patterns book are considered to be non-generative. And so if you wonder why, and for those of you who have been to Plop and wonder why Richard Gabriel is so crusty, it's because he's looking for generative patterns. Okay? So he's looking at a higher standard. And so the question you ask, well, are my patterns generative? Ah, okay, that's a paradigm. Okay, system as a whole is not the object, but a way of an object, focus on holistic properties. A generating system is not a view of a single thing. It's a kit of parts with rules about the way these parts may be combined. And almost every system as a whole generates a generating system. Now, um, in the architecture literature, you end up, um, actually, there's some more recent stuff by Schumacher, and he makes a difference between autopoiesis and allopoiesis, which is system stuff. Autopoiesis means self generating, which is what generative is. An example of an allopoetic system he talks about is a factory production line. Because you have build a car, the car doesn't reproduce itself, right? It comes off the end. That's allopoetic. So you have allopoiesis, allopoiesis autopoiesis. But he, in 68, he says, in a properly functioning building, the building and the people in it together form a whole, a social human whole. The building system, which have, we have been created so far, in this sense, do not generate holes at all. Okay. So then we start having this discussion. So yesterday, uh, Max Jacobson asked me what I think. That, that I think that Aishin was beautiful, and I paused, and I get into this sort of, in, in, this sort of question. Is, is it generative is a question, or is it beautiful? That's a different question. There are different questions at play here. So that's number one. That's Alexander. Number two, system approaches enemies. This is actually one of uh, Wes Churchman's later works. But let me uh, cut it down for you. He was a philosopher of science, and uh, in particular, he was focused on metrology. Metrology is the study of metrics. How do you measure things? So he's interested in progress. If you have progress, how do you measure it? So if you're going to say more beautiful or something like that, he's going to say, okay, how do you measure it? That's what his philosophy is all about. But he was focused particularly on morality, mor uh, morality, religion, and aesthetics as enemies of the system's approach. Because the system's approach is highly rational. Okay, so how do you deal, how do you get over the rationality? And he says, in effect, you have to deal with these things head on. The third person, um, how many people here have heard of Wicked Problems? Okay. How many people have read this article, Dilemmas in the... S okay. So this is the problem, is that people use the term Wicked Problems, and then they go take pattern language at it. It's like Riddle says that a Wicked Problem is a certain thing. Okay. So what he says is um, there is no, defi def no definitive formulation for a Wicked Problem. You can't define a Wicked Problem. So how are you going to write a pattern language if you can't define it, all right? Wicked problems have no stopping rule. When you start working on a wicked problem, how do you know when you're done? You're never done. It's, you, what you do is that you try to improve a system which causes a problem somewhere else, and then it's like, well, it's better to have the new system than the old system, so we'll live with the side effects. And then you fix it, and they say, oh, that causes the other problems, so we're going to fix this other system, okay? Um, they're, the wicked problems are not true or false, or but good or bad. There's no intermediate, no ultimate test of a solution. So for next time you use the term wicked problem, look it up. You can find this on Wikipedia. And, and so the question you, that you should be asking is, and people who are in design thinking need to read this article harder, because what they do at Stanford is that they promote, we should be using design thinking for wicked problems. It's kind of like, have you read the definition of wicked problem? It says you can't solve it, so why are you taking this approach? Okay? So um, there's definitely conflict between Riddle's view of the world 
and Alexander's view of the world so much as a famous publication. Actually, it was Max Jacobson interviewed Christopher Alexander, and Christopher Alexander said he was leaving the design methods movement. Um, that was the first one. And Horace Riddle created a second generation where he's trying to fix some of the deficiencies in it. So you've got all this background, and we're still like uh, 1973, right? So we're still way back there. Okay, so if we take Alexander's work, I just took the last slide and pushed it all down to the bottom. What I'm going to do is overlay um, very quickly, okay? Um, so it's going to be very quick, because I'll cover some more of this tomorrow if you come to the workshop at 930. Um, but what I want to do is overlay some of the ideas that come along. So, number one, the idea is what is it you're actually doing, and what is your definition, and what is the context Christopher Alexander started with? This idea of architecture as problem-seeking and design as problem-solving. This is the context, because you go all the way back to 1969, and on this book called um, Problem-Seeking in Direction of Architectural Programming. So the question of architectural programming comes in. The problem with architectural programming and the solution is that it is not a one-to-one -one mapping. And that, that's where people fall down. So the joke is made, okay, uh, you have a, uh, a kitchen, well you cook in the kitchen, and you have a living room, so I guess you live in the living room, and in the bedroom, I don't know what you do, it's like one of those single functions. So you don't think that way, right? You think more holistically about how the whole house would be done. Uh, Horace Riddle had some principles for design an education system, and so under context C, design configuration D will lead to performance P. This is a lot, lot, lot like pattern language, right? And so this is 1971, it's predating stuff that Alexander did, so there must be an influence. Um, and there's lots of work that's gone on in, uh, in Horst Riddle's community, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, but the idea of architecture versus design in software, uh, Grady Booch, who is a, a distinguished engineer at IBM, says all architecture is design, but not all design is architecture. So there's various ideas here about what it is you're actually doing and proposing when you're working through this. Um, wicked problems led through to uh, issue-based information systems. Uh, they had the wicked problems, and it goes up through hypertext. And for those of you who use Compendium, uh, which is a mapping tool, um, they, that's one way of, uh, of mapping out the conversation and what's happening. Um, systems approach. Uh, this leads to, to a lot on assumption surfacing and of course normal science. So you, you end up dealing with the questions of how do you know what direction is moving forward. And, and it works through Churchman, um, Mitroff, and various other people. Now, pattern language actually shows up, and people think that it doesn't show up that much. It actually shows up not so much in a pattern language. The timeless way of building has influenced agile software development. So if you're going to look at it, like, you're looking at the wrong book, uh, and you have all this work on agile, and when you talk to people on agile, they have a sense of Christopher Alexander. They may not have read all the details, but they understand things like piecemeal growth, and they work through that. Ecological epistemology. Now, so this is a shift, and this is, a, this, this is an issue uh, in dealing with uh, the philosophy under Christopher Alexander. Alexander is primarily a structuralist because he's dealing in the physical world, and you can see things. What happens when you go into an immaterial world and you can't see things? You're talking about social relationships. Um, so we go back to Gregory Bateson, the steps of ecology of mind, on how ideas interact. We have J.J. Gibson, who does the ecological approach, um, th uh, with response to behavioral psychology at the time. And this has gone through to Don Norman with affordances and goes through to uh, Tim Ingold, the best person that kind of explains all this stuff. And if we go hard into the system theory, hierarchy theory, uh, where you have systems of behavior interconnected by the higher and lower constraints. For those of you who have seen um, Stuart Brand's How Buildings Learn, and you have different layers in time, that's essentially hierarchy theory. Um, and then it, it comes into the resilience literature in socio-ecological systems. So the people in the Stockholm Resilience Center, in effect, are based off here. And finally, the last one is moving away from products to services. The question is, so you, when you think about even building a house, is a house a product or is a house a service? Right? And if you move that change, you, know, you have the idea of co-production, where people work together. You have the idea of offering. And uh, most recently, service dominant logic for the way to do it. There's been the advent of what's called service science. So all these things are happening at the same time, and the reason I'm lining these up, if all these are happening at the same time, but if you're staying with Christopher Alexander, you're very focused on the very narrow domain.
So why do you want to pay attention? Um, this comes from uh, Ayn Nitroff, and uh, my favorite quote, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. So from statistics, most people should know about uh, a type 1 error and a type 2 error. When you're doing a statistical test, a type 1 error is false <coughs> positive. So you, know, you took the drug, did the drug work? Well, you say it works, but actually didn't. You have a false negative, which it didn't work, and you say it does. Now, type 3 errors, which they sometimes call answering the wrong problem perfectly, um, is tricking ourselves, unintentional error to solving the wrong problem. And what he's now focused on is type 4 errors, which are tricking people on purpose, which is, in effect, what happens with Donald Trump. So um, you have to watch out. But my question is, in the paradigm which you're working, are you explicit about your paradigm, or are you fooling yourself, or are you fooling other people? So this is a, a little <coughs> bit of reflexivity. <coughs> Now, the way that I work through this is, um, from, uh, I, for people who are still reading Alexander, I recommend starting with the battle book from 2012 and working through that. Uh, and what I've done is gone through and created what I think is his methodology. And so step by step, um, firstly, paradigm of the community. That's only the first part that people focus on. Then you have the construction budget where he shrinks everything down to make it fit within the budget on the site. And then the third part is the reality of the land, which is a really interesting part, where it's designing the pattern of the buildings with the pattern of the land. And he turns both of them. And this is a systems idea, because you've got two systems that are working together, and you're trying to coordinate them on top of each other. So based off this, this is how I got into um, the service system thinking and the paper that I presented last year. Um, what I'll do is uh, recommend that we actually take a dialectical approach. Um, so Ian Mitroff, uh, this from the systems community, has various methods, and the way that we do this is through dialectic. So the question you'd ask today is, how do you know if a pattern is correct? And usually it's what we have called an inductive consensual um, acquiring system. And what that means is when everyone says it's a good pattern, it's a pattern. Well, is that science? Is that the way science works? So if we do a dialectic instead, we have an opportunity to approach from a different way. So this is where I'll leave you. This is the paper from last year, um, the Pearl Conference. And in this is a position on recommending. So I took, I took the um, battle book, and I created a method off that. And if, if that's what you believe a pattern language should do, my judgment is that we should actually spend more uh, time we should pay more attention to what Alexander did. Less attention on what he writes and more on what he did. And that's how I got here. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Just come in. That's perfect. Thank you very much. A lot of food for thought. Thanks. Yes? I wonder, um, a couple of other parts of potential layers that one I've always uh, wondered myself whether the idea of um, or Alexander's idea of pattern and so it was pretty consistent with Arthur Kirsten's idea of the whole, where um, an entity is both um, a whole in itself as part of something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I haven't been able to find um, any reference particularly. That, that's the problem, right? That, I, I think it's influential, but finding the reference, I haven't seen it either. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the other layer I think is interesting is where um, Alexander, in the timeless way of building this on, seems to take on that layer of um, Eastern uh, philosophy, mm, Eastern yes. religions, which was part of the Berkeley movement in the flower yeah. power and so on. Yes, yes, agreed. Yes? Where would you fit the Santa Fe stuff into this? The whole complex adaptive systems uh, the, the, stuff? The, sorry, the, the... Santa Fe stuff, uh, complex adaptive systems. The, 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 the complex adaptive systems is part of systems theory, so I deal with it there. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the 15 properties that he does in Nature of Order, I think they're only relevant in physical space. They're not relevant in social space. And so if they're not relevant in social space, then we need to adjust the paradigm. Okay? Yes? Uh, Andrew Skulikowskis, a Vilnius kid in the University of Lithuania. I'm curious, uh, 
so, given, like you said, what they write and given what they do, mm -hmm. um, how do you, and given all these different paradigms, mm -hmm. how do you make sense of uh, what works and what doesn't, or what's functional or what's dysfunctional, or what's true or what's just false, or what's just uh, Kool-Aid, you know, that people are drinking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because uh, there's the deconstruction thing where, I mean, maybe you don't have any way to do that, right? And so, and then there's the authoritative where they'll tell you, yeah. you know, but so you're in the middle. So how do you, like, so what could you say? Where, where did Alexander get it right and where did Alexander get it wrong? Okay, so we're talking about pure, pure academic rigor here. There you can either prove it on theoretical grounds or on pragmatic grounds. So one, you have the theory and you prove it like you do in physics. Mm -hmm. Or two, it's pragmatic, it works. And, um, and so I'd actually like to cite the Agile software community. The Agile software community is totally pragmatic. It's like, why do you have stand-up meetings every day? Because they work. Okay, is there a theory behind that? We don't care about the theory, it works. Right. And so uh, w that's why I'm focused much more on the pragmatics. If we want people to use pattern language, they want to know what works, as opposed to doing all the theory. It doesn't mean the theory isn't important, but now you start dealing really in the paradigms and having discussed that, which is the PhD level discussion. Okay. So maybe uh, we're, we were late and now we're, as we are? Yes. It was, but you fit into the time very well. So as a timekeeper, I applaud you, you, <laughs> you. you know, fitting in so many decades. Okay. You're talking. Thank you. Thank you.